Amen. Well, praise God. Let me uh, reiterate. It's great to see you all here. Every one of you, you're extremely welcome. It's, uh, it's always a great delight to come to worship the Lord with brothers and sisters. And uh, to know that, you know, that although God is with us all the time, also he's placed us in family. And so we can know the warmth of even relationships one with another as well. And that's so important too. And that's so wonderful. And uh, good to be here indeed. Well, this morning we're going to continue on with a study we started the last time. Um, we're teaching and it's looking at the subject of navigating life in a changing culture. And uh, we'll be continuing with a study from the book of Daniel. So if you want to open your Bibles to the book of Daniel, because I believe we can learn a lot from the book of Daniel regarding the subject of navigating life, I suppose, as a follower of God and a culture that increasingly is really abandoning the things of God. And I think we can learn a lot from the book of Daniel in relation to this. Now, the last time out, if you remember, we looked at the big picture. Um, remember, I used the analogy, if you go to do a jigsaw puzzle, sometimes it can be very confusing if you immediately just start to look at the, pe the individual pieces. But the first thing you do is you look at the overall picture and you see what you're building. Then it sort of makes sense, the individual pieces start to make sense of where to slot them together. And so last time out, we looked at the big picture really from Daniel chapter 2 and chapter 7. We saw there um, the dream that Nebuchadnezzar had in chapter 2 and Daniel's vision in chapter 7. And really the big picture there is that, that we took from all this was though there was many kingdoms, many empires and everything else, God is always ultimately in control. So God is always in control. That was the first and important thing. The second thing we learned from that was that all earthly kingdoms will come and will fall. Only God's kingdom remains forever. Those are the, the big two points we took from the big picture. So as we try to navigate life, it's so important for us to understand the big picture. First of all, no matter what we face in life, God is ultimately in control. No matter how chaotic things may appear, God is in control. And secondly, though how strong and permanent some kingdoms and ideologies and everything seem, every kingdom, every empire will come to an end. Only God's kingdom will remain. It's so good to know. And so we have such confidence to step out in life and, and to take the steps as a follower of God and start to navigate through life understanding the big picture he's in control and ultimately only his kingdom will endure that's so important for us but this morning i want us to look at a little bit i suppose how to navigate the day-to-day -day decisions of living here in a culture you know it's fair to say a post-christian culture and even a culture that is increasingly almost anti-christian in its ideology how do we navigate now these, the individual decisions that we, that we make in that? And so that's really what we're going to be uh, primarily looking at today. And we're looking at it, as I say, from the book of Daniel. And this is a great book to look at it because, as we'll see, um, the guys from Daniel, the, the young fellows, Daniel and Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego and that, they were taken into captivity. They left. They were taken away from their culture and planted into a different culture, a foreign culture completely. So how did they cope? How did they navigate through life? And we're going to learn some lessons, hopefully, that will help us as well. So why don't we pray? And then let's turn to God's Word together now this morning. Heavenly Father, today we humbly stand before you with our eyes fixed on you, the author, Lord, and perfecter of our faith. Today, Lord, we acknowledge that you are in control of each and every situation and circumstance. Today, we acknowledge, Lord, that your word declares that only your kingdom remains. And Lord, today, we pray that as we just open your word together, that you will speak. Lord, that you will speak into our lives. You will help us to make those day-to-day -day decisions that we need to navigate life Lord, as your followers here for your purposes. So, Lord, speak to us, we pray today, Lord. Just open up your word to us. Give us ears to hear, hearts to embrace, Lord, what you have for us, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. 
Amen, indeed. Okay, so we're going to begin Daniel chapter 1, if you've got your Bible, uh, beginning at verse 1. Let's read. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the articles of the house of God, which he, brought, which he carried into the land of Shinar to the house of his God. And he brought the articles into the treasure house of his God. Then the king instructed Aspenaz, the master of the eunuchs, to bring some of the children of Israel and some of the king's descendants and some of the nobles, young men in whom there was no blemish, but good-looking, gifted in all wisdom and possessing knowledge and quick to understand, who had ability to serve in the king's palace and whom they might teach the language and literature of the Chaldeans. And the king appointed them daily provision of the king's delicacies and of the wine which he drank, and three years of training for them, so that at the end of that time they might serve before the king. Now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Isaiah. To them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave to Daniel the name Belshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. I'll leave it there at the minute. Now, in our last study, remember I mentioned that no matter how challenging, chaotic things may appear, ultimately God is in control. And sometimes events can seem very confusing when they unfold, almost shocking. And we're kind of like, where is God in this? Imagine being these guys. You know, the, this army comes against them, besieges them, and takes them into captivity. Where is God in this? And often in life, we can be left to those frustration, frustrating cries in our own heart too. I just don't see you in this, God. I don't see you. But remember, we have to go back to the truth that we learn. God is always in control. And what does it say in verse 2 here of this? Even in this situation, verse 2, the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, into Nebuchadnezzar's hand. Actually, we don't have time to go in, into this as such, but partly God used the Babylonians as judgment, to come as judgment against Israel for their rebellion and for their rejection of him. And for particularly, they went in for 70 years because they failed to keep the Sabbath, and God misses nothing. He misses nothing. And so he allowed the land to be replenished for these 70 years because they missed the Sabbath for all those years. And it's, it's quite incredible. But God is in control. That's what I want us to see here. Even in this chaotic situation, ultimately, God is in control. So let's see how these men adapt to their changing circumstances. After all, they were taken into captivity, so they were relocated from their homeland. They were re-educated in the ways of Babylon here. They were even renamed in honor of the Babylonian gods. Just think what that was like for a moment. To be taken out of your homeland, completely separated. No such thing as internet and video calls or anything else. You were gone. That was it. Then re-educated. Everything you were taught, you were told to forget about. Now learn our educators. So we're going to start and we're going to indoctrinate you basically in everything to do with our culture. And finally, like, we're going to rename you in honor of our gods. My goodness, like to deal with this, this was, wow, it's pretty heavy stuff, isn't it? And yet it's very interesting with these guys, when they had all their identity and that stripped away, the first thing we, we notice from this is there's no obvious um, rebellion in their hearts against the people they've been taken into. At the beginning here, there's, there's no, I suppose, they're not uncooperative. And I, actually, as we'll see this, you know, they're given favor and stuff going forward. But there's something in that for us that, that we're going to come back to. They've left their culture, they've been forcibly removed from their culture, and yet they keep their hearts right. So that's the first point I want us to think about. And, you know, how would we react, as I say, if we lost our family, our friends, our culture, and everything else, and completely gone, and you we were forced to take on a new identity, forced to take on um, yeah, just a complete new identity? Would we keep our hearts right? 
Well, you know, these guys, they kept their hearts right, and that's very important. But verse 8, let's see what happens as this unfolds. Verse 8 together. Then, but Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with a portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. Now, this might seem like a strange thing to, uh, for the guys to take a stand on, on the food, but we need to realize that the choice of diet really was just an outward working of an inner conviction that these guys had um, of what it meant to follow God, what it meant to belong to God. And, you know, they're living in a, in a culture where, you know, the meat was probably sacrificed to the idols and to eat with it would seem that you're really in deep fellowship with and in agreement with uh, completely this practice. And, and so they just wanted to keep a kosher diet. And it was like the last tangible thing, the thread that kept them to their faith and their culture. And so it was, it was like that last tangible thing. And they wanted to to take a stand on this. Notice what it says here. It says, Daniel purposed in his heart. That means he made up his mind beforehand. There was a point he had already made up his mind. I'm prepared to be taken to a different place. I'm not going to fight that. I'm prepared to learn all your ways. I'm not going to fight you and all this. I'm not going to reel against everything that's different to my culture even though I don't agree with it. I'm not reeling. I'm not obnoxious to you. I'm not reeling against it. I'm allowing you to be re-educated. You can even rename me in honor of your foreign gods. It's all okay. But this aspect, of his faith is to remain, his personal faith, God is to remain. And these guys are prepared to make a stand on their faith. And this is what we see here. Even if it risks upsetting the king. And what would happen if you'd upset the king generally in, in those days? Probably be fatal. Severe consequences. Most people probably wouldn't love to see the following day if you upset the, a king in those days. And yet they were prepared to take this stand on this issue and risk upsetting the king. But notice it said they purposed in their hearts the decision was made beforehand. And um, and this is something we're going to come back to a little bit. But I want us to think that, hold that, you know, saying as well, they purposed in their heart. Because I think for Christians as well, we have to understand there's times and there's decisions that have to be made that we need to have purposed in our heart. I'm for Jesus. Though the world says this, I'm for Jesus. Yes, I'll cooperate and... You know, We'll pick it up in a wee bit because I'm going to come back to this in a bit. Don't want to get ahead of myself. So from verse 9 going forward here, just for the sake of time here, I'm just going to summarize. Um, you can look along in, your, in, in the Word. It said that God brought Daniel into favor with the goodwill of the, the chief eunuchs and everything. So that's an important thing. God will give his people favor. God always looks after his people. God will be an advocate. He'll raise up an advocate on your behalf. And God gives favor to his people. may not work out the way we immediately want it to work out or the way we would plan it to work out, but God's hand is on his people. We're his people and his hand is on us. So remember that. It's very important. Also, verse 10, if you notice here, it talks about, um, you know, Daniel requested to have his own diet of vegetables and water and that, and the eunuch was scared, and he says, I fear the Lord, the king. If I do that, you know, my head's on the chopping block. Next. But, um, but notice that Daniel fears the Lord, while the eunuch just fears the king. And that's so important, because we'll all will be facing questions to this. Who do we revere who do we serve do we serve just our leaders at a purely you know um, earthly level or do we ultimately serve the lord and we'll all have to face this as well there's a eunuch here who says he fears the king but daniel feared the lord and that's something to be um to be aware of for ourselves so Daniel comes up in verse 12 with a suggestion, and notice he does it politely. 
He's not obnoxious. I love that about these guys. As I say, they're not reeling against. They're not obnoxious out making a big issue of stuff. There's politeness. There's a gentleness. There's a firmness. But there's a, pl- there's a respect. Because all authority is given of God. And the Babylonian authority was given in judgment, but it was still ordained by God. And so you, to respect that authority and to come with respect, and so notice even the way he says, please test your servants. There's a politeness. And, and, and that shines through this. And you see that verse, the end of verse 13, he says, you know, please test us and everything, vegetables and water for 10 days and that. And at the end of verse 13, and he says, and as you see fit, you deal with your servants. You know, as you see fit. We're willing to allow you to carry out what you need to do. There's a humility there, isn't there? There's a politeness and a humility. And I think Christians need to have this as well. We need to have a firmness. We need to have purpose in our hearts. But we need to be polite. And have a humility about us. So in verse 12, in a way, he wisely, Daniel, he wisely, politely deals with this challenge. Um, and at the end of the day, what's the result? Verse 15. Um, their features appeared better and fatter in flesh than all the young men who were out of the king's uh, delicacies. So the lads were eating only vegetables and water and they ended up fatter in the flesh than all the, the guys who were out of the king's delicacies and everything else. Now this isn't some miraculous or this isn't some radical new diet to be followed. This is a miracle from God. And this is something we're going to see all the way through Daniel, how powerful God is. How wonderful he is, you know, and how we can have our confidence placed in God. That even though they took away out of their diet the things that would naturally help them in that, God replenished and made them, you know, far healthier looking. At fatter in 10 days, they looked fatter in the flesh. It's a miracle of God. He goes on to say, what else did God do there? These four young men in verse 17, God gave them knowledge and skill and wisdom. And Daniel gave visions and dreams as well. So God miraculously cared for them and God just looked after them, gave them knowledge and and skill and uh, and vision and dreams and that. So it's wonderful. So the main point here that I want to just draw very quickly from chapter 1 that we've looked at as though these guys were relocated out of their culture, they were re-educated, renamed and all that, they went along with it until they reached the point where they had purposed in their heart that they were going to stand for the Lord. It was a serious issue and they were going to take a stand and prepared to face the consequences. But God honors his people. God shows himself miraculous here and he delivers them from any of the potential harm that was going to that could potentially come their way. So in this instance, he delivers them from the trial, in this instance, okay? But let's continue. Continue with me here. We're going to skip now to chapter 3. So skip over in your Bible there to chapter 3, because we come now upon a situation where their stakes are raised a little bit higher again in chapter 3. To summarize here, just the beginning of it, Nebuchadnezzar, full of pride, he builds this big statue, to himself and he says everyone you've got to come now and bow down and worship the statue and if you don't I'm gonna throw you into the fiery furnace so I'm gonna kill you horrible death awaits you if you don't and we see these guys Shadrach Meshach and Abednego they don't bow down they don't bow down and so the hall before the king and he's furious and so we'll pick it up here verse 16 you know, he, he's furious with them and he warns them again, you know, that they're going to go into the fiery furnace. And what do they say to him? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered the king and said to him, O Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If that is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which we have, which you have set up. 
We have no need to answer you in this matter. These guys had purposed in their hearts that they would not bow down and worship a foreign god, a false god. They weren't going to break the first and second commandment. They had already purposed in their hearts that they weren't going to do that. So when the issue arose, we don't even need to answer you in this. The matter settled in our hearts. We're not going to discuss. We're not, you're not going to persuade us some other way. It's settled in our hearts, and we'll take the consequences. You know, this may seem, I suppose, far removed, maybe, from what we experience here in Ireland, having to face such a decision, being forced to bow down, forced to um, declare allegiance to these false gods and that. But today, in many parts of the world, we were praying at the beginning for Afghanistan. This decision is being made, probably as we speak today, by some brothers and sisters on the ground in places like that. And God, by his grace so far, has spared us from that. I don't know. We can't... um, predict will the situation change to that level here but today our brothers and sisters around the world many of them face that decision and many are prepared to stand up for the Lord not bow down to false gods and willing to take consequences so how anyway was this how was the the guy's faithful stand on this matter received by the king well let's look at it verse 19 we see They heated the furnace seven times hotter than ever before. Verse 20, they were all bound and they were thrown into it. It was so hot in verse 22, it says that the men who who carried them and threw them in, they died with the intensity of the heat. So hot was it. Wow. So they were thrown into this fiery furnace. And then verse 24, what happens? Then King Nebuchadnezzar was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying to his counselors, Did we not cast three men bound into the midst of the fire? They answered, said to the king, True, O king. Look, he said, I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they're not hurt, and the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. Verse 26, And Nebuchadnezzar went near the mouth of the burning fiery furnace and spoke, saying, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out come here and they came out from the midst of the fire and all the satraps administrators governors the king's counselors gathered gathered around them and saw that these men on whose bodies the fire had no power the hair of their head was not singed nor the garments affected and the smell of fire was not on them incredible not even the smell of the fire was left on them you know in the previous trial that we had mentioned God miraculously delivered them from it here he miraculously miraculously delivers them through it but God is with them in both instances God is with them one they were spared from it here they were brought through it delivered through the circumstances and you know sometimes we can miss this as believers Sometimes we're only looking for God to deliver us from situations. But often God, for his reasons, for his plans and purposes, will maybe deliver us through a circumstance. But God is always in control, and we can trust him completely, as we'll see here, and the outcome of this. Because not only... Did they come out of this freer than when they went into it? Because the very bones that, you know, had bound them were burned off. You know, they couldn't move going on, and then they were able to walk out freely. And very often God will do that with trials in our lives. Sometimes as we go through difficult circumstances in our life, and as we journey with God through those things, do you know what happens? The very fears and, and the things that bound us and cripple us in life are burned off by the presence of God. And we begin to walk in a freedom that we never experienced beforehand. And there's many Christians miss that. Many believers walk throughout life still bound. They're unwilling to allow God to take them through things. 
God wants to set his people free. But I suppose that's another, that's another message, another sermon there. I want to keep on point. But just be encouraged. You know, God can set us free uh, through, through things. But what's the further result to this? Verse 28, Nebuchadnezzar spoke, saying, Blessed be the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Send his angel and deliver his servants who trusted in him. And verse 29 says, Therefore I make a decree that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut into pieces and their houses made an ash heap, because there is no other God who can deliver like this. So God miraculously delivers the guys through the circumstance. But God also gets his name heard throughout the whole kingdom. The whole kingdom. The king announces it to the whole kingdom. There is no God like the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But would the whole kingdom have heard the message if they weren't prepared to trust God and entrust themselves to God? Well, in this case, God used that circumstance showed his glory, and the whole kingdom heard of the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Oh, so encouraging. So encouraging. May we have eyes to see what God desires to do. God desires that everyone has an opportunity to hear of him. God desires that all come to repentance. All come to repentance. But look even what happened to the lads. Verse 30. And the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego to the province of Babylon. So God gets the glory through the whole kingdom, and the guys even get a promotion. As a side thing. It's just wonderful. Fast forward to chapter 5, quickly. Chapter 5. There's now a new king in town. Daniel is now under Belshazzar, who's reigning in Babylon. Pick it up in verse 1 of chapter 5. This guy, Belshazzar, the king, made a great feast for a thousand of his lords and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. While he tasted the wine, Belshazzar gave the command to bring the gold and silver vessels which his father Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple, which had been in Jerusalem, that the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines might drink from them. Then they brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem, and the king and his lords and his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze, iron, wood, and stone. So here we see now the new king, Belshazzar, puffed up with his pompous pride, throwing this big party, thousand people there to celebrate with him. And he takes that which was holy, that what was supposed to be used to bring glory and honor to God. And he now uses it showing off in a drunken party. How sad. This culture that Daniel was living in, from the very top, was taking that which was holy, and was made to bring glory and honor to God, and was now just abusing it, and showing off in a, in a drunken party. You know, as I read this, I suppose two things sprung to my mind. One, just on a physical thing. Have you, ever, have you ever driven through a place where, you, where you've passed, I suppose, old churches from the past? I've often thought as I've walked past them, I walked into them, you know, about the gospel that was preached here, maybe the people who encountered God here, people who came to faith in these places, and maybe they've been repurposed now as nightclubs in countries and in places where so much happens that wouldn't bring honor and glory to God. That's just on a physical thing. We know God doesn't dwell in buildings and that, but still it, it caused me to immediately think of that again. Sometimes I'd almost weep, you know, standing in places, just thinking about people who served, people who prayed in places, and now it's just completely been repurposed for something completely godless-like. 
but also what about things that God has set up that were holy? What about, what about marriage? What God has designed, God has defined in Genesis 2 between one man and one woman for life, that they would complement each other and that they would reflect that relationship between Christ and the church and that the world would look at marriage and see the relationship of Christ and the church. But now, the culture is taking it and it's just profaned it. It's just man does what is right in his own eyes, what seems right in his own eyes. What God has declared, we don't care. You know, I read um, an article where a woman, I'm not sure which country she was from, she decided to marry herself. Why not? Another person who read about wanted to marry their pet. Why not? And all the community around them fully support their decisions. What about our culture, which legally has now brought in marriage between same-sex unions? That which God had set holy, set apart to reflect him, has now been taken and used by culture in an ungodly way. This is the culture that Daniel lived in. And, you know, it's, it's just a picture from this here. How he must have felt living in this culture, seeing the article has been used for wrong purposes. But into this situation, we haven't time to go through the whole, the whole um, chapter, but into this situation, in an instant, God speaks into that situation. A hand appears on the wall, and he writes on the wall, um, Mina, Mina, Tekel, what is it? Mina, Mina, Tekel, Upharsan, I think it is which means God has numbered your kingdom, Belshazzar, and finished it. He says, you've been weighed in the balance and been found wanting. Your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. So right into the, this moment of this immoral celebration, this big party, God speaks right into it in that second. He says, it's finished. You've been weighed in the balance. Your kingdom's been given to the Medes and the Persians. And that very night, the Medes and the Persians deposed him. He was killed. And the kingdom was lost. The Medes and the Persians took over. God spoke right into that situation. But imagine being there on the outskirts, first of all, and looking on with a thousand people there and this new king. And, you know, you'd almost, in the flesh, you'd be so intimidated. Oh, my goodness. You know, it's, and the profanity going on and just like, oh. But into that situation in a flash, or in an instant, God spoke in and brought a change. You know, there's also a picture here, and again, having time, I'd love to spend time on this, but there's a picture from this that also speaks to the end reign, the time of the Antichrist is coming. And again, just right at that moment in the last second half of the, the tribulation years, which is known as the Great Tribulation, you know, the Antichrist, he takes a seat on the throne Antichrist means against Christ or in place of Christ. And there he is, taking a seat, thinking he's got everything under control. And right at that moment, Christ appears. And it says, with the glory of his appearing and the breath of his mouth, the Antichrist kingdom, everything is consumed and is no more. Here we see a four-picture of that in this instant here as well. You know, God is in control. God is in control. And in an instant, he can bring a change. Do not be intimidated by situations and by culture that may be setting itself against God. Don't be intimidated. Don't be obnoxious and real against everything either. Be polite. For the non-essential things we'll see repeatedly, and we might see this next year quickly too, you know, there's a willingness to embrace, there's a willingness to let some things go, to let some things slide, the non-essential things. But these guys have purposed in their hearts, remember. And we'll see this again now, Daniel. We'll skip on to it, because for the sake of time, we need to do this. Chapter 6. Very quickly. Chapter 6, folks. 
We find Daniel at this stage. He's 80 years of age. He's under a new king, King Darius. And um, he's basically been, he's one of the three governors of the whole kingdom and he's been set up. These guys don't like him. They want to bring him down. So they try to, uh, try to look into his past history. So for 50 years of public service, they scrutinize all his accounts and everything else and they can't find anything. No dirt on this guy after 50 years of service. So what do they do? We've got to get him on his faith. On his faith. So they go after him. So they go to the king, get him to make a decree that nobody is to worship any other, pray to any other God other than Darius for 30 days. And um, or else they'll be thrown to the lions. So what does Daniel do? Chapter 6, verse 10. Now when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with the windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. And so here we see Daniel coming to this point that was a step too far from he wasn't prepared to compromise on this here. So he, he didn't hide away from it. He, he wasn't, I suppose, um, going to be de deterred from his natural worship, his normal worship of God. He goes home and does exactly what he did every other day. He had no temple to go to. He was you know, in captivity. He was in exile in, in Babylon. So there was no temple, but he went home. He made that point three times a day. I'm leaving the busyness. Think of this. He was the the top three running the whole country. How busy was this guy? Imagine every day in the middle of important business. Right, guys, back in a bit, I have a priority. I'm <laughs> just leaving it way back home to pray. And they all knew this, and they probably hated it. Oh, Daniel's at it again. Oh, my goodness. You know, this lunch break Daniel takes to pray. Goodness sake, you know, I'm back again and not... Early evening again, I will push through the work. No, Daniel's off. Priority number one, I'm going home to pray. Going home to worship. So anyway, Daniel, he's not shaken by this new edict by the king here, this new ruling. He just carries on doing exactly what he always did. And he's prepared to face the consequences. This is the thing. So anyway, the king, for the sake of time, the king knows he was set up. He... He tries to undo the law, but he can't because his word is declared as the word of God, so we can't undo it as such. So anyway, he is Daniel reluctantly thrown into the lion's den. Then verse 21, let's pick it up very quickly. Darius goes to check on the fate of Daniel. And Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him and also a king I've done no wrong before you. So Daniel was brought out perfectly fine. God miraculously shuts the mouths of the lions. Daniel is spared here. And again we see the outcome. Daniel is delivered through the severest of trials. Facing death again rather than rather than obey the king. And yet we see God delivers him through the trial. And what's the result to this? Verse 25, Then King Darius wrote, To all peoples, nations, and languages that dwell on the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every kingdom, every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed. His dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues. He works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth, who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions. So again, God delivered Daniel through this, the most severe of trials, and the whole nation now the people of the Medes and the Persians all heard about the God of Daniel. You know, sometimes I think that we can be so desiring to keep our comfort and I suppose um, things like acceptance among our peers that there's an unwillingness in us to make a stand.
But God used the difficult trial, the difficult circumstance in both these occasions that the whole of the, first of all, the Babylonian kingdom heard about God. Not only did, you know, did he spare Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and Daniel and that, but the whole of the Babylonian empire heard about God. And now we use Daniel as occasion here, and the whole of the empire of the Medes and the Persians heard about God, got a testimony of God. Isn't that incredible? We're looking to, we're looking for, the, you know, the word of God to be spread, for people to hear the gospel message. Maybe God might use some difficult decisions that you might have to make in your, in your own life. But God may, may have a desire to reach many people in your workplace, many people in your, your community, by seeing us stand as a light. Not fearful, but stand as a light for God's glory. And my heart is that we as individuals would depend on God. That we would remember it's the same God that we serve today. Same God that delivered Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego from the fiery furnace. The same God who delivered Daniel from the lion's den. It's the same God who will never leave us or never forsake us. I pray that we'd get excited to be in in these days in which we live, in this culture that we live. Yes, it may be fast changing and we may not feel as home here anymore as we used to with all the the new rulings and the way culture so rapidly changed. But in the midst of it, is this an opportunity for the testimony of Jesus to be heard loud and clear? Not obnoxiously, Not reeling against every decision in our culture, but with humility, with a gentleness, with a loving heart, but with a firmness, got a purpose in our hearts to serve God ahead of any anyone else. We haven't time to look into this today, so I'm gonna close just this one thing. If you think, oh well that's all, Steve, that's that's the Old Testament. Like we've recently studied Romans and we've studied Romans 13. We've studied probably 1 Peter 3 and that tells us we have to submit to the government on all things because they've been ordained by God. Yes, but you also read that the disciples, when they were pulled before the authorities, Peter and John were there because they were out preaching. And they're pulled and he says in Acts, possibly it's 4. I'm not sure now. I need to, I need to look so you can find that very quickly. Acts 4 does, yeah. Acts 4 verse 18. They call Peter and John and says, Do not teach any more in the name of Jesus. And what do they say? Peter and John answered and says, Whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you more than to God, you judge. For we cannot but speak of the things that we have seen and heard. There's, a, there's an authority that surpasses government authority. That's the authority of God. And we need to understand that. As Christians, we need to be the most conscientious, best citizens that this country has. But when you're asked to do something against what God has commanded, as the disciples were here, then we must respectfully say, I'm going to serve the Lord first. Because His authority usurps any earthly authority. And that's so important for us to to understand. So folks, this morning, we're going to close. But may we take from this today, first of all, understand again the big picture. Everything's framed in the big picture. God is always in control, folks, no matter how chaotic things appear. Only his kingdom will last. Every other kingdom, every other ideology, everything else will go, will come to naught. Only God's kingdom will remain. He's called us to be a part of that kingdom. And he's given us the Holy Spirit to help us make those decisions on a day-to-day basis. And we need to be, to walk by faith. It means walk by by being in the Word of God. Walk by faith, not by sight. What does God tell us? 
How does God tell us to live? Not just how does man tell us how to live. God's not given his people a spirit of fear, but of love, power, and a sound mind. Do not be fearful, brothers and sisters. Do not be fearful. Instead, be filled with the Spirit and walk forward confidently, knowing that our shepherd's going to lead us. He's going to guide us. He goes before us. He comes behind us. He is working out his plans and purposes. And guess what? He's invited us from Kilrush and Milton Malbay and Aina and Corafin and La Hinch and Ennestimon and all around this area to be a part of this. And Ennis and Cree, Norway, to be a part of it. In these last days, God's message Let's pray that God's message gets heard right across the world, but especially in the place that he's asked us to live, for his glory, and let's depend on him. Let's pray. Will you stand with me, and let's pray. Love and Heavenly Father, we, we do thank you that you're such a faithful God. We thank you that you are sovereign. Lord, that you are all-powerful. Lord, we thank you that we can trust you completely. Thank you, Lord, for being our shepherd, the good shepherd who leads us and guides us. And I pray, Lord, that Lord, we would be a people who would listen to your voice. Lord, that we would walk by faith, not by sight. Lord, thank you. You haven't given us as your people a spirit of fear in these days, but of love, power, and a sound mind. I pray, Lord, that we would just be available for your plans and purposes. But thank you, the God who delivers. Lord, thank you, the God who has saved us, Lord. Thank you, the God who has rescued us when we were far from you. And Lord, our heart's desire is that many would come to know you. And Lord, would you use us for your glory. Father, help us to shine for you. Lord, not to hide our lights, but to shine for you. Lord, will you give us wisdom on the day-to-day -day decisions that we make, both as individuals and as families and corporately as a church? Lord, help us just with those decisions that we would honor uh, honor the elected officials. We honor those you've placed us under. Lord, that we would conscientiously seek the betterment of where you've placed us. But Lord, also, Father, help us to purpose in our hearts to love and serve you first and foremost. Give us strength. Give us confidence as your people to make those difficult decisions, Father. Lord, decisions that might impact career opportunities, might an impact social acceptance. And Father, I pray you would just uh, be with us, help us to shine for you. May your glory be heard about all through Clare, Ireland, and the world. Lord, we pray. Lord, just bless your people this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.